Well, hey everyone, thanks for checking out our next episode of Mixed Messages with Jeff Bogue. As you can see, this is a little bit of a different setup if you're watching online. But what we're doing here is we hit a little bit of a summer schedule, so lots of crossed paths. Jeff and I are, uh, I feel like, in one state, out of one state, in another country, in another one. It, we're just kind of totally ships in the night right now. And so what we're doing this summer to wrap it up is a few episodes taking a look back, taking a rewind, taking a look uh, at some of our best ofs mixed messages and bringing them back to the forefront. Things that have been the most helpful with a lot of our listeners and taking a few weeks here just to look at what are some of these topics, what are some of these ways that God has helped us navigate all those mixed messages around us. So sit back and enjoy one of these throwback episodes as we explore what Jesus is doing and where he's calling us in the midst of all of these different messages. Thanks a lot. Jeff. Joe. How we doing, buddy? I'm uh, miserable. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. <laughs> well, this concludes. No. <laughs> uh, I don't think you're miserable. You're laughing. We're going to pretend like you're not miserable and record a podcast. It's all a facade. <laughs> it's all a facade. Wait, the misery or the... No. <laughs> Good deal. Well, here's our question today. This one has actually come in a few different ways uh, through our channels, but the crux of the question is simply this, Jeff. Doesn't God just want me to be happy? Uh, no, he doesn't. I, the um, it, I guess it depends a little bit on what you mean by happiness, but when you say, doesn't God just want me to be happy? I'm like, no, that's mm. that's not in the Bible. That's not realistic. That's not life. And I'm not sure that's God's goal for your life. Yeah. So let's let's break that down. I think a few things that you said there, uh, you emphasized uh, just, you emphasized me, you emphasized happy. So what do you mean by doesn't God just want me to be happy? It, it, God's highest calling on your life is not for your life to go the way that you want it to go. Uh, God's highest calling on your life is for you to willingly invest your life into God's sovereign plan for your life. And happiness is, first of all, happiness is a moving target. Um, and so what makes you happy when you're 10 is not what makes you happy when you're 20 or when you're 50. And so um, that's why we don't always give, uh, God doesn't always give us what we, we want, right? So number one. Number two, God never promised us a life of ease, a life of painlessness, or what we would call happiness. Hmm. Because happiness left to itself is shallow, right? So uh, I love Disney World, got kids, taken them there a gazillion times. Disney World's kind of famous, the happiest place on earth. And I actually would say they might just be right. <laughs> and Disney World, while fun, is shallow. Sure. So a talking mouse, a talking duck. Changed my life. <laughs> <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Like, like that, there's no meaning to it. It's, yep. It is entertainment. It's it's fun and fine to go there for a couple of days. It's an escape, but there's absolutely no meaning to it. And if you only lived at Disney World, you wouldn't be happy. You would the noise would start to bug you. The lines would overwhelm you. The cotton candy and the chicken nuggets would slowly start to kill you. <laughs> right? It's it's unrealistic that that is that way all the time. Yep. And for some reason, I think a lot of it's a false teaching by people who say that they're pastors and, and claim to be a part of the church. Some reason we've applied that to God, hmm. that uh, with my relationship with God, I should be devoid of pain, devoid of struggle, devoid of uh, trials. And I would argue if you're devoid of those things, you will also be devoid of depth. Sure. And you will be devoid of meaning. And you will be devoid of very important things in our life, like accomplishment, completion, overcoming, the things that actually give us uh, joy and actually give us uh, maturity and actually give us a life that we appreciate and value. Sure. Right? Even some of our um, closest relationships and our families and our closest friends 
they feel close because we can compare them to folks that are harder to get along with or we're just simply not close to. If yeah. everybody just made us happy all the time, well, who's the closest to you? That, that it's It would only be shallow because right. it, if, everybody, if everybody made you happy all the time, that means that nobody's helping you with your problems. Nobody's helping you overcome. Nobody is grieving with you when you're grieving. Yep. See, so if 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 I want to be happy all the time and a loved one dies and somebody comes in and is like, oh, it's no big deal. How you doing, big guy? They they Disney World you. Yeah. You're going to feel hurt and removed. When in reality, the opposite is true. The people that I go through the most painful things with are the people that I actually am close to. Hmm. And it's it's not that I live in misery all the time because... Disney for the weekend is great, right? So we have those moments of lightness and even shallowness and just like, wasn't that movie awesome? There's nothing wrong with any of that. Sure. But if that was that way all the time, um, you know, Joe, you and I have worked together for... 13 plus years? 13 years, okay. So you think about all the hours and the pain and the sacrifice to uh, build Grace Church together. Yeah. So that bonds us as friends, but it's also like that's one of our great things that we would look at in life and say, "I've spent my life." So, most meaningful thing in the the most meaningful things in my life are the most taxing things on my life. Grace Church is is uh, hands down <laughs> one of one of the most taxing things in my life. I wouldn't want to do anything else. Being a father is taxing. But I, I, it's that's probably the most valuable thing in my life to me. Marriage is taxing, but it's the most valuable thing. Disney World isn't taxing, and I could take it or leave it. Sure, yep. I don't actually value it. I enjoy it, but I don't value it in any way, shape, or form. So let's take this question then to the next level. Um, <clears throat> what is there are places in the scripture where, um, Happy is almost retranslated as blessed, or maybe in reverse. Yeah. Um, you know, and even Jesus has the Beatitudes where he walks through, you're blessed here, you're blessed here, you're blessed here. Um, so when God does seem to express in the Scripture some version of maybe it's something in the Old Testament, he wants the Israelites to be blessed, or he wants his believers and children to be blessed, like, what is he talking about if it's not, well, I want you to have Disney World experience all the time? Yeah, so blessing <clears throat> in the Bible, and by the way, uh, in the Beatitudes, that word blessing translates into happy. Mm-hmm. So happy are you, happy are you. Happiness in the Bible is never a goal unto itself. It's the result of the real goal. Hmm. Okay? So blessed are you uh, when you hunger and thirst for righteousness. The goal is to hunger and thirst for righteousness. The result is I'm happy or I'm satisfied with that. And I could go on and on and on. It never means this state of euphoria that is not attached to anything, right? So um, happiness as a goal is absolutely unattainable. Happiness as a result of a goal or as a description of a deeper state. Like if uh, um, if you said to me, Jeff, when are you happiest? I would say, when I'm with my family. Doing what? Pretty much anything. Sure. I don't really care. I just want to be with them. I'm not saying there's like this, of, there's this euphoric state called happiness. What I'm saying is I'm content and satisfied, and fulfilled, and at peace. Sum that up for me. I'm happy. <laughs> right? Yep. So so we use, we use the term wrong, and then we would look at God and say, make me happy. Well, what would make you happy? Well, if you took all my trials away. Well, that won't actually make you happy. Yes, it will. No, that's denial, that's shallowness, because raising a three-year-old is a trial. (laughs) Right. And if I took the most taxing thing in your life away, I'd take your child. Is that going to result in happiness? Well, of course not. All right. So 
what we want then is you're saying to me, mature me and complete me so I don't lack anything as a mom raising a three-year-old. Okay, I will do that. And the end result of that is you'll feel happy. Sure. Or content or at peace, et cetera. I love how you're shifting what we pursue. <clears throat> and I think that um, that might be one of the most subconscious things that messes us up in this category is so many of us, we do pursue that moment of pleasure. I got to see the next movie. I got to eat the next delicious thing. I got to have the next leisure time. Uh, I've got to go pursue the next sexual satisfaction, whatever it might be. But those always leave us wanting because we're pursuing the byproduct or the the yeah, the byproduct as opposed to the thing that gets us there in the first place, the real thing that gets us there in the first place. And that's in some ways, whether they meant to do it or not, it's accidentally pressed into us from our culture. Right. You know, we're supposed to pursue a life of happiness, you know, is what our culture would say. And so if if that's the antithesis to what God is saying, or at least it's a misunderstanding, well, no wonder we're all kind of convoluted in well, should I go after this? Should I just pursue this woman because she makes me happier than my wife right now? Should I pursue my hobby because they don't drive me nuts like my kids do? Like, if it's all about pursuing happiness, we leave all of that behind. Yeah, and and and, and that pursuit, that life, you know, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I'm not sure the pursuit of happiness. Uh, I, I'd have to ask them if I ever bumped into them. Like in the, I, I'm not sure the founders meant it the way we meant it. Yep. I think what they meant was safety, uh, contentment. The government isn't going to take away what I earn. Like, like the pursuit of a life of contentment and fulfillment that is a life that I kind of own. This land is mine. These crops are mine. Those kind of things. I think when we talk about happiness, we're talking about a emotional state of euphoria. Mm-hmm. And it's, you can pursue it. I would even say that you could achieve it. Like, you know, uh, when I see a good movie, it makes me happy. Like, that was fun that night. Uh, I, you know, we, I like to watch the Buckeyes when they beat Michigan. I'm like happy. I'm like, that's awesome. I, it puts me in a good mood. It's a state of euphoria. It has nothing to do with real life. Yep. <clears throat> because, because the, the meaningful things of my life, um, would take precedent. If, if one, if I was watching the Ohio State Michigan game and Ohio State was, uh, won on a last second field goal, and I, my son called me and said, Dad, I was just in a car accident. I would not give a rip about Ohio State. I'd ne- probably never even talk about it again. Yep. Right? The, my happiness then comes from the fact that he's safe. It's just the totaled car. You see what I'm saying? Like, like you, you suddenly you like challenge this, this ambiguous state of euphoria with real life, and you're like, Actually, in real life, it doesn't take a lot to make me happy. Hmm. And what I mean by that is like content. If my kids are safe, if Heidi is safe, if they feel loved, if she feels loved, if we're, I don't care if we're watching a movie, I don't care if we're going to Disney World, I don't care if we're on a cruise, I don't care if we're sitting in the backyard having a conversation. Yeah. See, I'm happy in those moments. So so I, I think what you're saying is why is like, and what the scripture obviously I think would teach is you go after depth and then this happiness or this joy or this contentment will follow that. And I would go back to things like you seek first the kingdom of God. Yeah. And then all these other things are added unto you. I seek God's kingdom. I'll find all kinds of happiness along those ways. I'll find it in pain, I'll find it in grief, I'll find it in sorrow, I'll find it in vacation and a good movie and the Browns winning. Sure. Now, let's let's take that a step farther, Jeff. Um, and, and you actually hinted it at it a second ago. If we find happiness, like real contentment in some of these valuable things, what happens when those things get turned upside down? So maybe tragedy strikes and we lose like a young family member, 
Um, and suddenly we're like, well, that was one of the things that, mm-hmm. I, that I would say that was a valuable thing in my life that my happiness was attached to, and now it's gone. Well, didn't God just want me to be happy? Why would God do that? Why would God cause me pain? And kind of that onslaught of questions. Yeah, so the, I th- there's a big difference between happiness and joy. Mm. And the joy of the Lord is our strength. So even in the darkest, most agonizing moments of our life, there can be joy. And that joy may be the presence of a friend. It may be the presence of the Holy Spirit. It may be a memory. It may be... So my my happiness is going to come and go. I don't have a lot of control over that. Joy is produced by the Holy Spirit. And so I can lean in and I can have a joy and a peace and a patience and a kindness, things that I cannot manufacture on my mm-hmm. own. Um, so I think I think that's an important delineator because this achievement, as we're defining it in our culture, this achievement of happiness is absolutely unachievable. Yeah. Um, but living in joy, 100% achievable, because joy and pain always coexist. Hmm. Right? So they, they, they're always there together. Uh, my, pain, my life is not going to be pain-free. My life is also not going to be joy-free. Yep. So what I'm doing is I'm saying, which one of those two things is going to, am I going to lean into? Mm-hmm. Am I going to be overwhelmed by the pain or am I going to be overwhelmed by the joy? That does not mean the other one is absent. Sure. And there, in the most agonizing moments of life, there are times, I think, that we are overwhelmed with pain. But the Holy Spirit starts to quench that fire with joy. There's other times, you have a child, if, you, if any of you are parents, the first time you hold your baby, you are overwhelmed with joy. Like, you're just like, oh my gosh, what has happened? Right? You're overwhelmed with joy. Well, think of the mother. Her joy is, is overwhelming her pain in that moment. I, I'm always blown away that, uh, that mothers will have more than one kid. I'm like... I I wouldn't, <laughs> you know, but why? Because the the joy, and then you start looking at that with Jesus. You're like, but for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. It doesn't say he avoided the cross and got joy. Yeah, you see, what I'm saying so. So those things are always going to coexist, and 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 the happiness is as being defined kind of in our question here is is the absence of all of that. And I'm like, that's not realistic, that's not life, and that's not Jesus, and that's never promised in Scripture, not once. Hmm. That's really helpful, Jeff. I, I think that this is something that messes with all of us, and so having a sobering moment like this, I think it helps us get on the right track. Now, there's another side still to this question of happiness, and that's when... Um, for lack of a better word at the moment, that's when almost like twisted or even sinful things tend to be what quote unquote make us happy. Mm -hmm. And sometimes those feel so deeply rooted in us, we might be tempted to say, well, this is how I was created. This is how I was born. Mm -hmm. This is what drives me. What do you mean I shouldn't do these things? That's what makes me happy. And so it could be anything from uh, mean sarcasm. I love making fun of people. Yep. I love putting them down. It makes me feel fantastic. <laughs> uh, it could be just dark humor. You know, it could be I love searching the web for all this crap, and it makes me laugh when they make fun of people dying or blah, blah, blah. Uh, it could be pornography. I click on this. makes me feel great. Yep. makes me happy. could be the pursuit of some type of sexual conquest. It could be our uh, sexual attraction. Uh, it could be all of these different things. Again, we kind of sometimes land in this, well, if I've always been this way, did God create me this way? And if that's what makes me happy, shouldn't I be allowed to pursue it? Yeah. So now you we changed the subject. Mm-hmm. We did. Uh, <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, because <clears throat> we're not talking about uh, we're talking about the state of euphoria, mm-hmm. but we're not we're talking about if I'm a Christ follower pursuing Christ, wanting to be defined by the Holy Spirit, and I go through pain and ask why why doesn't God just let me be happy? I'm asking that context, that that question in the context of pursuing God. Yep. 
and wrestling through my relationship with God. When I look and say, um, I'm naturally a sinner and I'm the most happy when I'm sinning, I'm asking that context, that, that in the context of rebellion. And so you're talking about temptation now. We're not talking about entertainment. We're, we're talking about temptation. We're talking about rebellion against God. And the scripture would speak to that. And they would say, there's a way that seems right and done to a man, but in the end it leads in death. So all you got to do is change the subject. Hmm. Why can't I eat a Big Mac every day? It will kill you. Why can't I smoke a pack of cigarettes? It will kill you. Why, why can't I drink as much alcohol as I want? It will kill you. But it makes me happy. Yeah, and I do know, because I've had almost that, that exact conversation with someone before, and it says, well, what's wrong with doing it and just dying early? Yeah, it's not your body, it's right, not your good. life, it's yeah. not, you know, et cetera. So, so you're in rebellion. Mm-hmm. And the warning from Scripture is funny. God doesn't often stop our rebellion. He warns us of the consequences of it. Sure, yeah. And the warning in Scripture is it leads to spiritual death. And, and you, um, I, think, I think the church I grew up in it would be like, uh, yeah, when you're out partying and drinking, you're not really happy. And I'm like, I was. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I don't think that's true at all. That that's not the point. The point is, when you are rebelling against God, you're in trouble. Yeah, you know, and 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 that trouble is going to lead you down a path that's going to get out of your control, and that out of your control might mean physically. It does mean spiritually. Yep. And when you are no longer bothered by your sin and you no longer feel conviction of sin, that is actually an act of judgment. This is Romans chapter 1, from a righteous God to you. When God gives you over to your sin and it does not bug you anymore, you're in trouble. Sure. But I'm happy. No, you're in trouble. Yeah. You're in real trouble. Yep. Right? So the... This is back to do what makes you happy. I'm like, you will not find that in the scripture anywhere. Yep. God affirms whatever makes you happy. You will not I will give you my house. You <laughs> will not find that in the scripture anywhere. That is not true. Jesus did not live that way. The apostles did not live that way. The early church did not live that way. They did not think that way. They did not think that's what Jesus was saying, and neither did his disciples. Yep. None of them thought that. So those, those are heresies that are taught today uh, from prosperity, health, and wellness preachers who are mm-hmm. twisting the Scripture for personal gain. And, um, and those are lies that are received by, the Bible calls them itching ears. They're the lies that affirm our personal lies. Yeah. And it is a pathway, the Bible would say, to death and destruction. And for the believer, for the Christ follower, you're looking and saying, "Is do I think that way too? Because I think we do sometimes, right? And when that happens, I'm capturing that, bringing it back under Scripture and saying, okay, God, uh, you have something greater than my next sexual conquest for me. What is it? Yeah, that's really good. And I think... Um, at a real-time uh, attempt at kind of summarizing some of the things you said, these godly things that you might pursue are going to lead you to true happiness and joy, and these quote-unquote happy things that you think are what make you happy will lead you toward a spiral that leads to death and destruction. Yep. Um, it's really, and that, really good. And that, that <clears throat> sounds old-fashioned and fire and brimstone-y, and, and I'm like, it's just what the Bible says. Yeah. And, and it, it's it's a warning because God loves you, yep. Um, and trusting Him, you know, is a thing. I, when when um, when my kids t- turn eighteen, uh, so Heidi and I have have raised six kids, and then our daughter in law, so we have seven now. But when my kids turned eighteen, the night before their eighteenth birthday, I look at them and I literally say, "Tomorrow, Daddy cannot bail you out. Hmm. Like you have to know that." You, you've been raised as a child. You've been taught to think like a child. Uh, it's been okay that you act like a child. You make the mistakes a child makes. But in the United States of America, tomorrow you're a man, you're a woman. And when you call me, I can't help you. Mm-hmm. You have to understand that. 
that's not me being harsh. No. That's me saying, son, and eventually my daughter, like, son, I love you. <laughs> you want to you wanna go drive 80 miles an hour when you're 16? Daddy can go to court with you. You want to do 80 in a 20-mile-an-hour 20 uh, 20 zone when you're 18? You're going to jail. Yeah. And I cannot stop that process from happening or influence it for yep. you. That's really good and and hard to hear, um, but I think we need to. Um, it's <laughs> if you haven't felt the effects of um, that that sin, those things that you think make you happy but are leading you towards spiritual death, then um, it's like getting an early cancer diagnosis. It's just yeah, you can catch it early, get it out now. Yeah. <laughs> um, but well, that's uh, sobering but very very helpful. And if you would like to submit a question like this or follow up one, you can always do that at bath.gracechurches.org slash mixed messages. And if we can help you in any of these areas, whether it's, you know, resources on taking your thoughts captive, whether it's getting into community to wrestle some of these things through, or maybe it's that last sobering thought and you need help to get out of that spiral, we'd love to do that. Reach out. We'd love to help and uh, love you through that. If you want more of what you're hearing, make sure you subscribe, follow, rate, and review our podcast. And if you're looking for a church home in the area, uh, make sure that you check us out on the weekend. Or if you're not in the area and you're trying to figure things out, you can always join us online as well. Well, thanks for jumping in with us today as we continue to seek God's voice through all the mixed messages around us. We'll catch you next time. All right, boys. Every time, every time we listen to the podcast, we hear